This is the video lecture for Thursday, January 10th uh, for microbiology for biology students. And we're at chapter one, and we're about to finish chapter one. Where we left off, we were just covering the basics of the theory of evolution. And um, the theory of evolution is, again, we treat it as a theory in this class. Um, a lot of times with secular textbooks, it's treated as if it's a uh, fact. And however, it is a theory. And there is also the theory of intelligent design, which we will talk about a little bit as well. But because we're using a secular textbook, uh, we talk about the theory of evolution uh, directly and this is a very important underlying theme for microbiology. And even if you don't espouse the theory of evolution, it's important to know it because a lot of biological science has been formulated around evolutionary theory and it can enhance the understanding of microbiology. Um, the theory of evolution relies on hereditary changes um, that happen over a long period of time, these changes. Uh, are purported to happen gradually. And this results in organismal, uh, structural, and functional changes. And really what we're looking at, there are two prongs of the theory of evolution. The first one is on this slide, and actually the last two bullets just reinforce the first um, um, facet of the theory of evolution, which is natural selection. And another way of saying natural selection is survival of the fittest. And this provides selection pressure. This is again a part of natural selection. And as the environment changes, then environmental changes will favor particular traits. And those traits will be favored over and against other traits that are detrimental in a given environment. And so the species will change. Okay, um, and the other prong of the theory of evolution, really there's two prongs. One's natural selection, the other one is common ancestry. And so if we talk about common ancestry, that means that all new species originate from pre-existing species and truly from a strict evolutionary perspective, then you say that all species on earth have a single common ancestor. Okay, and when you look at close, closely related organisms, especially uh, now in the days that we can look at phylogenetic profiling, you can see similar features because they evolve from a single common ancestor. And phylogeny, which I just mentioned, is the relatedness of two organisms based on evolutionary descent. And it's all based on genetics now, molecular genetics. Uh, looking at the sequence differences between the small subunit of ribosomal RNA for the 16S portion of ribosomal RNA. If you look at the phylogenetic tree, you can see um, the different domains. Okay, and this is this is odd. It's it's actually I don't like this slide because it's split up into five kingdoms, which is not really um, correct. Instead, we talk about three domains, which are bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And in the domain eukarya, there are four kingdoms, which are protists, plants, animals, and fungi. Uh, we don't really use the term monera anymore for prokaryotes. Again, um, we go to a higher level than kingdoms, and we talk about domains where archaea and bacteria are distinct domains from eukarya. And here's just another phylogenetic tree. It gives you uh, bacteria, archaea, and in this case, eukaryota. And the relatedness, again, this is based on se sequencing. And so if something is close on the phylogenetic tree, it doesn't necessarily mean that it looks similar, but it is indeed genetically similar. Okay, and archaea, um, Uh, the term archaea has only been around um, for a small amount of time, less than 50 years. And archaea as a domain was found by the fact that the small subunit, um, our ribosomal RNA, the 16S small subunit, um, was so much different than bacteria. These are 
um, small microorganisms that look a lot like bacteria, but they have different characteristics, some characteristics that are more like eukaryotic cells. Uh, the difference between archaea and bacteria was first discovered by Carl Woza, who hypothesized that this 16S small subunit of the ribosome uh, was a living record of the evolutionary history of an organism. Okay, we used to call archaea back before it was a domain and scientists dis decided that it was in its own domain. We used to call it archaeobacteria. And because it was so different than bacteria or eukarya, it is a prokaryote, so this, this bullet isn't quite uh, accurate. Archaea is prokaryotic. Um, because it had a different small subunit um, ribosomal RNA from bacteria and, and eukarya, then it was designated its own domain archaea. Okay. And it is now a general, generally accepted domain, separate domain. That shouldn't say prokaryotes. It should be a separate domain from bacteria and archaea, or from bacteria and eukarya. Okay, so prokaryotes are in the domain bacteria and archaea, and eukaryotes are in the domain eukarya. Okay, so to review this, um, this is from the lecture that I did on Tuesday. What did Lewin Hoke invent? Didn't really invent anything. Remember, um, he popularized the use of the microscope to look at living organisms. Uh, however, the microscope was invented about 100 years uh, prior to his use of the microscope. Okay. What's the difference between a hypothesis and a theory? A hypothesis is a tentative explanation of a phenomenon based on observation, and it must be testable. Once a hypothesis has been tested over time, then we have a theory. And the theory is a hypothesis, which has been affirmed, not proven, if it's proven, it's a law, but a theory that has been, a, is a hypothesis that has been affirmed by a large body of data taken over a long period of time. Okay. The two taxonomical categories making up a binomial species name, like Homo sapiens or Escherichia coli, that would be genus and species. Selection pressure, this is a part of the theory of evolution, although it doesn't uh, complete the theory of evolution. But when you have environmental conditions that will favor certain organisms, this is selection pressure where uh, different traits and organisms are selected over and against other traits merely because of environmental change. Phylogeny. Uh, you should know these. Phylogeny is relatedness based on evolutionary descent. It's not based on morphology. It's based on uh, 16S single subunit ribosomal RNA sequencing. Okay, so when two organisms are in close proximity in the phylogenetic tree, it simply means not that they're morphologically similar, it means that they're genetically similar. Their 16S sequences are genetically similar. Okay, and that concludes chapter one. So what we'll do is we'll go on to chapter three, okay, which is the next chapter. We're skipping chapter two. So I'll go ahead and open up chapter three. Uh, let's find it. Okay, bear with me. There's chapter three. Okay, and in chapter three, we're introducing the tools of the laboratory. We want to give you a basis for the laboratory experiment. Um, and as we do that, you'll feel more comfortable with microbial technique. Okay, so our objectives in this chapter are to first look at how we cultivate microorganisms, the types, methods, and characteristics. Uh, we'll have five I's. Actually, there's an S before the I's. There's sample collection. Then there is inoculation, incubation, isolation, inspection, and identification. And I'll go through those in more detail as we go through the chapter. Uh, we want to talk about the characteristics of microbial media, a different soup that we grow the microbes in. 
And then obviously we want to get very, very comfortable with the microscope, all facets of the microscope. When we observe bacteria and archaea under the microscope, we have to use the highest level of power, thousand uh, X for the scopes that we have in the laboratory. So it's important to understand the microscope. Okay. So when we cultivate microorganisms, it's important to note that we are introducing microbes into an artificial environment. When we get microbes in, in a natural environment, usually they're in mixed culture. So there are many different species of bacteria or archaea or uh, uh, microbial eukaryotic cells all in the same community. But in order to cultivate them, we have to separate out the individual microbial strains, not only at the species level, but also at the strain level, which is below the species level. Okay, so we grow microbes on artificial medium, okay, media, and often that media is so different than the natural environment, say taking E. coli out of the intestines and, and growing it on some type of broth. Um, that distorts the ways that the microbe will act uh, slightly from what it, how it would act in its natural environment. Okay. It's also important to know that microbes are individual and they're very widely distributed. So um, we carry microbes on us all the time. The environment has microbes. So it's very easy to contaminate pure cultures, pure strains of bacteria, and that uh, when we have undesired bacteria contaminating our cultures, that will alter our results. Okay, so when we culture microorganisms, we have the five eyes. But first, we have to have specimen collection. That's the one S. Okay, so we obtain a sample from a source of microbes. It could be body fluids, could be tissues, could be from food, water, soil, or it could just be a pure culture that we've obtained from somebody else. Okay, then we take that specimen and we inoculate it into a container of nutrient medium. Um, we must make sure that our medium prior to inoculation is sterile. Then after we in inoculate, then we incubate that. We keep it at the appropriate environmental conditions. Uh, usually that is temperature. Um, and sometimes you may control environmental gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, or humidity. But mostly in our laboratory, we just maintain a temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, which is about physiological temperature. And we incubate the microbes, say, overnight or for 48 hours. Okay. Then we start to see growth. And you can see growth as sediment. Like sediment are particles that uh, sink. Okay, so you can see that they've sunk to the bottom of this vessel. Uh, you can have turbidity, which is turbidity is just another word for cloudiness. And then sometimes you have scum floating on top. And not pictured here, you have what's called flocculant. And these are particles that don't float or sink. They just stay suspended in liquid. Okay, so we've had inoculation incubation and then once we have grown our cultures then we want to isolate or separate an individual bacterial cell um, from the other cells and provide it actually adequate space so that individual cell will grow into a colony when you have a colony and it comes from an individual cell that consists of a single species and now you can isolate that species correctly after you isolate the species then you want to inspect it you may want to look at the color, texture, and size of the colony. And you may also examine the uh, microbe under the microscope, looking at cell morphology, uh, shape, size, uh, motility. Is it moving? Uh, and then you also use staining techniques. And you may use biochemical tests in order to inspect and understand this microbial species further. And then finally, if you've done a good job at an inspection and the other four eyes or three eyes, then you identify. And we want to identify bacteria at the species level. A lot of times this is important in diagnosis of disease to understand the species so you can prescribe the appropriate antibiotic or give the appropriate therapy for that particular infection. 
Okay, and here are three different types of cultures uh, you can see uh, for panel A. These are pure cultures, and you see one type of morphology. You see, you know, just single colors, uh, single characteristics of that streak. And when these are pure cultures and there's only one species, we call them axenic. Okay, axenic means a pure culture that's being grown on media. In panel B, you see what's called a mixed culture because you can see at least two different morphologies. There are white colonies and there are yellow colonies. They're in their mix, they're interspersed. And then C, you see predominantly one type of colony. You see these red, this is probably a bacterium called Sriracha. And you see the red colonies of Sriracha. And then there's just one spurious uh, white film or white blob in there. And that is indicative that at that white blob, there was just a, a source of contamination. So that contaminated the culture. Okay. And isolation, the third eye becomes very important uh, because you usually start with a mixed sample, a mixed environmental sample. And it, there are certain techniques that you want to use in order to isolate the cultures appropriately. Okay, so we take our mixture of sample, our cells in the sample, and then we spread that mixture, say it comes in the liquid, um, by diluting on auger. And then we spread it to the point where individual cells are isolated. And then each individual cell will grow up a specific colony with a specific condition. Here in this plate, you see two different colony morphologies, uh, rods that are uh, sort of yellow and spheres that are white. And then you see the colonies that are associated with those individual microbes. So microscopically, we can separate these, okay, just by diluting them out and spreading them on a plate. And then macroscopically, we get individual colonies, each that correspond with an individual species of bacterium. Okay, we put this on a medium containing auger. Auger is a lot like gelatin. It is just put in liquid media to cause it to solidify. Auger is much more convenient to use in gelatin because it's easier to maintain at temperature. And it's also uh, broken, it's not broken down easily by bacteria. There are a lot of bacteria that will break down gelatin. There are only a few bacterial species that will actually break down auger. Okay, and we can do three different types of dilutions. The top dilution is just a streak plate where we will inoculate in step one a very small portion of the petri dish. And then in step two, we spread out that inoculation with a sterile loop. And we continue in step three to streak um, with a sterile loop different portions. And by the time you do the fifth portion, which is actually uh, four streaks. Then you can see in the streak plate, when you do the fifth portion, you start to streak out into the main portion of the plate, then you get individual colonies that can be easily isolated. And that streak plate dilution method is the best dilution method to use. Um, you can use loop dilution or spread plate. Um, loop dilution is much more difficult to carry out. So we will actually do streak plates this semester in the laboratory. Won't we, there are, is a procedure in our lab, no, lab textbook on loop dilution. We will not do it um, because loop dilution, as you see, involves inoculating bacteria into molten media. And when you do that in step one of loop dilution, the molten media is usually hot and it can kill a substantial portion of the microbes. So you lose microbes just because of the heat. It's also difficult to maintain st sterility in loop dilution. And so this can contaminate the culture uh, very easily. But if you go through three steps of dilution here, loop dilution, and by the time you get to the third step, then you can isolate individual colonies. The final method is spread plate dilution and you just take a liquid culture. Uh, the liquid culture must start, it is fairly dilute with only a few bacteria within the liquid. And then you use a sterile implement uh, that we affectionately call a hockey stick that spreads it out and you just get a single dilution on a spread plate. 
Again, the street plate dilution is the method that's the most convenient. It's the most readily used in microbial culture and clinical applications and in other applications. And that's what we'll do this semester. So for the media, and the secrets in the sauce. So we consider the physical state of the medium, uh, what chemicals are in the medium, and then what is the function? What's the purpose? Are we just growing up a lot of bacteria? Are we isolating specific types of bacteria? Are we transporting bacteria? So we need to know the purpose of, the, of our experiment and which medium is going to be appropriate. Okay, so the physical state of the medium can be a liquid medium, doesn't solidify at room temperature. Um, uh, usually this is something very simple. We use uh, beef nutrient broth. Uh, no, you can't eat it because it comes from hooves. Uh, it's a nasty nutrient broth in terms of human consumption, but it's great for bacteria. We also use milk-based liquids. Uh, media can be semi-solid as well. This contains a small amount of auger or gelatin as a solidifying agent. Uh, auger comes from the red algae uh, called gelidium. And gelatin, as you know, just comes from bovine collagen. And you, you don't solidify this to a complete firmness, but what you do is you actually inject the bacteria into the media directly semi-solid, you actually stab it directly into the media and it allows the bacteria to grow at the stab and to grow away from the stab. And if the bacteria do grow away from the stab, that is a good determination of motility, that they're swimming away from the site of the stab. And um, also you can use semi-solid media if you want to isolate uh, uh, cultures that grow in anaerobic conditions because you can insert your inoculation needle deep into the medium uh, down where oxygen is not available. And then finally, solid media, and you don't grow uh, bacteria in solid media, you grow it on top. Okay, it's a firm surface, so you grow in a two-dimensional space. Um, auger is used, it will melt at 100 degrees Celsius and then it re-solidifies at 42 degrees Celsius and it can go back and forth, so it's very convenient to use. Uh, you can also use just simple uh, non-liquefiable media, things that normally grow microbes in your refrigerator. We use in the laboratory like rice grains, um, cooked meat, or potato slices. And if we look at the chemical composition of media, these can be synthetic. And synthetic means that you can precisely define the chemical as well as the content or the concentration of the chemical down to the molecular formula of every component in the medium. Non-synthetic or complex medium is not chemically defined. And so it's something that is where you have some nebulous component like coconut milk or beef broth, where you don't know this precise chemical formula, um, or it's very, very complex, then we call that non-synthetic medium. Um, beef broth would be non-synthetic. Uh, if you had medium that was two grams per liter glucose, that would be synthetic. But as soon as you take two grams per liter glucose and you add something like pancreas extract, then that becomes non-synthetic or complex medium because pan pancreas extract is not chemically defined. Okay, so pay attention to that. Next, we have the functional type of media. Okay, and mostly we grow on, on beef broth, which is a general purpose medium. And it grows everything, every, every microbe that will be sustained at that temperature under that condition. Uh, usually we grow at physiological temperature, 37 degrees C, so we can grow a broad spectrum of microbes. If we enrich the media uh, with complex organic substances, that may favor specific bacteria that we call fastidious. 
fastidious bacteria need particular growth factors in order to grow. And so if we have uh, those growth factors, then we call the medium enriched. For example, there are some um, microbes that grow better on blood. So we have blood auger. And then we also have what's called chocolate auger. And when I first heard about chocolate auger, I got really excited that uh, it was actual chocolate. But no, it's just burnt blood. So sorry. Okay. Then we have other types of medium, including selective media. And selective media will inhibit the growth of some bacteria and will uh, promote the growth of other. For example, if we put salt in the media, that will actually inhibit uh, most everything but Staphylococcus. Uh, because Staphylococcus, which grows on your skin, loves a salty environment. And a lot of bacteria, uh, other bacteria that can, cannot tolerate that high salt concentration. Uh, differential media allows everything to grow, but it actually creates differences in the colonies. So you can distinguish different species of bacteria based on visual differences. Uh, we use McConkie auger to, uh, on fecal bacteria, and this differentiates lactose fermenting bacteria, which we call fecal coliforms, uh, against lactose negative bacteria. Lactose fermenting bacteria in McConkie auger are pink red, whereas lactose negative bacteria are off white. So when we have a selective media, um, only one species grows, but when we have a differential media, then multiple species will grow and will have visual differences. Here's mannitol salt auger, which is both selective and differential. Mannitol salt has high salt concentration, so it only grows gram-positive organisms. Uh, gram-positive organisms have a thicker cell wall. But mannitol salt auger also specifically identifies Staphylococcus aureus, which is an infective type of staph. It um, takes the pink media and it will actually cause the color change due to a pH change. It will change the color to yellow. So mannitol salt is selective because it only grows gram positive, but it's also differential because it will differentiate Staphylococcus aureus by providing a yellow color. Uh, here's chrome auger, which is differential. A lot of things can grow in chrome auger, but you can see that there are lots of visual differences depending on the genus of the bacteria and the species. Um, anaerobic medium is uh, usually, it's difficult to maintain an anaerobic environment in the laboratory over long periods of time. So you can create a medium that has um, molecules that scavenge oxygen, like cysteine, that will actually bind oxygen and keep it away from the microbes and create an anaerobic environment. And then transport media, this is what we use to grow and maintain bacteria over long periods of time so we can ship the media. Uh, usually these are grown in glycerin and they uh, prevent the overgrowth of cells and don't allow the cells to grow, but they don't uh, they will preserve the cells so they don't die at the same time. Assay media, uh, these uh, are used when you're, when you're testing things like antibiotics. You put antibiotics in the media or you put disinfectants in the media, and then you see if bacteria can actually grow and um, tolerate the antibiotic or the disinfectant. And then enumeration media you use merely, it's a type of media where you can spread out the individual microbes on a microscope slide and you can use it to count individual bacteria. Okay, so let's review. Next we have the five eyes. Five eyes are inoculation, incubation, inspection, or I'm sorry, isolation, inspection, and identification. And don't forget the S, that's specimen collection. The three categories of media are, um, there are more than three categories. You can have the physical state, you can have the chemical composition, and then you can have the functional type of media. And each one of those categories is split into separate subcategories. 
Uh, synthetic media, remember, is chemically defined, completely chemically defined. And as soon as you add a component that is not chemically defined, like pancreas extract, then it becomes non-synthetic media. Uh, in defining a bacterial colony, you need to know that this is a population of bacteria that all came from a single cell. So because it came from a single cell, it is a single species. Okay, so let's talk about the microscope. Uh, this is Anthony von Lohenhoek. And here's a rudimentary microscope similar to what he used. Uh, the stage is not a stage, it's just the end of a needle there, end of a nail. And you put the sample on the end of the nail and view it through that hole. That's his simple microscope. And he achieved 300 times magnification using that. It's not very convenient. You have to you put things like dental plaque and, and it was a biofilm, so it was difficult to, to distinguish individual bacteria. But nevertheless, it was successful. Okay, I'm gonna skip that film. And here's a microscope. This is your best friend. I'd like for you to know the different parts of the microscope. Um, and I will, when we get into the laboratory, I'll go through this in detail and on care and usage of the microscope. We wanna make sure that the microscope is stored with the stage all the way down and the low, low power objective in position and also covered. I wanna make sure that the scope is turned off. Okay, and we'll talk about the microscope when we're in the laboratory on Monday. Okay, and these different parts of the microscope, um, you really need to know these because they will be on the exam, uh, on exam one. It's important to know the difference between the uh, parts below the stage, like the substage condenser, which actually condenses light on the sample, and then the aperture diaphragm control, which is also called the iris diaphragm, which closes down the aperture so you can see a smaller field of view. When we look at a microscope, we are looking um, actually at a real image. Um, so when you move the microscope left, then you're actually seeing the, it's seeing the sample move left. Uh, but if we look at the image um, prior to going through the ocular lens, we'll see a virtual image. Okay. And then actually in viewing, we're seeing a virtual image too. I'm sorry, I, I said that wrong. Uh, the reason why you see a virtual image is that the light rays actually come to a single point here, here, right there, and then they disperse in a different direction. So a mirror image is the virtual image. This is what you see um, at the ocular stage after this goes to this focal point. And, but if we looked here, we would see a real image, okay, because the light rays have not yet flipped. We focus light on the specimen, and so we have a condenser and a lens, and we have a light source down here. The condenser just focuses the light. So the real image is the actual image from the objective lens. The virtual image is a mirror image formed, actually it's formed not by the ocular, but by the fact that the light rays are going through a focal point and flipping into a virtual image, which is a mirror image. The power of the objective, that's the magnification power of the uh, lens that's closest to the sample. Power of the ocular, that's the eyepiece. And usually that's just, uh, in, in the case of our microscopes, we have 10x power. And then the total magnification is multiplicative. You just uh, multiply the objective magnification with the ocular, say if both are 10x, then the overall magnification is 100. If the objective is 4x and the ocular is 10x, the total magnification is 40. Uh, we also are, uh, need to understand resolution when we work with microscopes. This is the capacity of an optical system to distinguish between two adjacent objects. And this is in part dependent on the wavelength of light. It turns out that blue light or violet light has a lower wavelength and is better to resolve smaller objects, whereas a red light is has a higher wavelength 
and is not as good at resolving objects. So in our microscopes, we use a blue filter for better resolution, and that allows the light to wave at a lower wavelength, and we can see things below the micron level. This is also dependent on the numerical aperture of the lens. This is just a mathematical const constant that is um, associated with the lens, and it describes the lens's ability to bend light rays. Uh, numerical apertures can be at low power at 0.1 or up to 1.25 at highest power. And here's our resolution equa equation. Our resolution value is just uh, directly associated with the wavelength of light divided by two times the numerical aperture of the lens. So at higher magnifications, where we have a lower, higher numerical aperture, the resolution value is lower. So if we want to resolve smaller things, we want a lower resolution value. Okay, so we want it to be small so we can see small nanometer things. So we need a lower resolution value. And it's confusing because sometimes you'll buy a high res scope. When they say high res, it actually means that the resolution value is low and you can see smaller things. Here you can see a low res on top and high res on the bottom. And where you have high res, you can actually see individual microbes where at low res, it's difficult to tell the difference between two or three microbes. We use oil uh, because oil uh, at high magnifications will bend light rays selectively into the objective lens. And when we use oil, that will allow us to have a greater light collection capability and resolve images better. So we need the light to reflect, refract through the lens, not reflect away from the lens or reflect away from the glass slide. The more refraction that we have towards the objective lens, the clearer image and the brighter image we have. The numerical aperture uh, for oil is 1.56, which is much higher and much better than air or water. When we prepare slides for microscopy, we can do a simple wet mount. This is the stuff that you did in uh, elementary school with pond water. You just take a glass slide, you uh, put a cover slip on it, uh, on your sample, and you view it. Uh, to view live samples, you can use a hanging drop. And in this case, what you do is you take your sample and put it on a cover slip, and then you adhere it to a cavity slide, and then you flip the, uh, the cover slip and the slide over, and that hanging drop then hangs below the cover slip. You put an, a drop of immersion oil, and then you can see live microbes. The difficulty with a hanging drop arrangement is that it's three-dimensional. And with microscopes, you're looking at a two-dimensional space. So it's difficult because with a hanging drop mount, you can have an organism that's living and swimming, and it will swim out of, of your focal point, and it will no longer be on focus. Whereas with a wet mount and uh, with the other mounts that we'll use in microbiology class, we're only looking at a two-dimensional image. And the hanging drop mount would be better for viewing live cells because you're providing hydration. So you're providing an area where the bacteria uh, or other microbes can swim. And so, uh, whereas with a wet mount, when you put that cover slip on, the, the microbes tend to dry out and they become sluggish. So you cannot see them in a living environment. Uh, in microbiology, we'll primarily fix our smears. So we spread a thin layer of uh, liquid on the slide and we let it air dry. Then we heat fix it just by uh, flashing the slide through a Bunsen flame very quickly. And we want to stain cells because unstained bacterial cells are really boring. They're just kind of beige or translucent. And so it's difficult to see them. 
So we always use some type of stain. Uh, we might use methylene blue or crystal violet, and that allows us to be able to vividly see the morphology of the, micro of the microbes under the uh, microscope. And here are some different stains. You have simple stains here, where you have crystal violet for E. coli and methylene blue for Corine bacterium. Uh, you have differential stains that uh, will stain some bacteria one color and some a different color. Uh, Gram stain is a fundamental stain in microbiology where purple cells are gram positive and red pink cells are gram negative. In an acid fast stain, pink cells are uh, acid fast positive and blue cells are acid fast negative. And then at the below, below you can see spores are actually staining red. Uh, this is when a bacteria forms endospores. The spores stain a different color than the vegetative cells. And then there are special stains. Uh, here you can have a differential or a type of stain where uh, the background is stained and the microbe is stained, and then you see the capsule around the microbe, uh, which is the large circular area around each one of these uh, cryptococcus microbes. Um, and then you have finally a flagellar stain where you can see the little flagella on Proteus vulgaris, uh, sort of in a coil. And this was a basic stain used to directly adhere to the flagellum. A positive stain stains directly to the sample, the specimen. A negative stain stains the background. Simple stain just requires a single dye, and it's a very uncomplicated procedure. You just see the morphology. You don't see other characteristics of the cells. A differential stain is when you have two different types of bacteria. And so you have a primary dye for one type of bacteria and the counter stain for everything else. A differential stain uses two dyes. And the crux of microbiology is gram staining. This was uh, a type of staining method that was developed by Hans Christian Graham. Uh, it base, it's a universal diagnostic uh, method. Gram positive bacteria are purple. Gram negative bacteria stain pink. And really the Graham reaction is a difference in cell wall structure. And we'll talk about that in further detail uh, when we talk about bacterial morphology. Gram negative uh, have thinner cell walls, gram positive have thicker cell walls. Other types of stains are acid fast stains, and there are certain bacteria that resist acid attack, uh, primarily the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, called Mycobacterium tuberculosis, has an impervious outer layer that resists acid attack. And so acid fast bacteria can be stained um, in a differential procedure. Also, uh, this will test for bacteria that cause lepro leprosy and nocardia. Endospore stains will uh, spore, stain spores a different color than vegetative cells. We'll do this in the laboratory. And then we can have other stains that will emphasize certain parts like the capsule or the flagella. Capsule staining. The capsule is the coating outside of the bacteria. It can be diffuse, like a slime layer, um, but a capsule is usually more tightly associated. This is a protective layer on the outside of the bacteria, and we will stain the background and stain the, the cells, and then the capsule will appear white. Flagellar staining. Uh, we use a silver stain in order to reveal flagella. And so we can see them more vividly. They're very small and difficult to see, but you can see sort of the filament, uh, which is more, it's, this is whip-like, it's more like a coil. I think I will stop here with the first portion of the video lecture on Thursday. So let's stop and there will be a second portion to this video lecture.